As you can tell from the title, I'm going to talk about the doctrine of eternal security in this podcast, otherwise known as Once Saved, Always Saved. This is something that I have believed and taught for the past 15 or 16 years, though I've usually made the qualification that unlike most once saved, always saved believers, I still thought that apostasy was possible. That is, a Christian deciding to leave Christianity of their own free will, usually to save their life uh, because of torture or persecution or something like that. But the main difference now is that I also believe that one can lose their salvation uh, from sin. In fact, I, I think that's the majority of the passages about this that speak explicitly about what it is that caused them to lose their salvation. Sin is the primary reason. But yes, also because of persecution and tribulations and, and that, but also uh, believing a different gospel, believing specifically a works-based salvation, a la the Galatians or Colossian heresy. And so there are at least three reasons that I think one can lose their salvation. I'm going to pack a lot of information in this podcast. This is going to be the result of months of very careful, very uh, faithful, I think, study of the scriptures. It's also based on my own personal testimony, which I'll give at the end of this podcast, um, in which I, as a backslider, really do feel that if I had died, I would have gone to hell. And um, so I want to tell that story. This podcast is going to be in three parts. The first is going to be a discussion of the biblical arguments. I really want to give preference to those uh, criticisms that some might have, you know, Ephesians 1, 13 and 14, and, and uh, all these things I want to talk about first. I want to give you the basic thumbnail of the argument uh, from the Bible. And then I want to talk about just some notes that I've had as I've been thinking about this for the past few months and what, how we interpret those things that our pastors say about this and the damage that it's doing. And then in, in the last part of the podcast, I do want to give my testimony about um, 13 years of backsliding and how it culminated in, um, I feel like a last chance. And I didn't even understand at the time that hell was on the other side of that. I didn't understand what last chance meant. I didn't understand any of this doctrine until later. And I also want to say that I am so free now. I am so full of joy, just like I was when I was first saved. I feel, I, I thought that was a thing that you just, it just faded away. You know, you have that of sort of honeymoon period with your uh, salvation where you want to do everything for the Lord and you don't want to sin and you just feel so empowered to not sin, like a power that you've never experienced before. I thought that was all something that just faded away. Now I know the reason that it faded away and I have it back and I'm excited and full of freedom and joy to live this life. First, let me give you just a brief description of what I'm saying and what I'm not saying. I'm going to expand a lot on all of these topics, so stick with me. I believe that we are saved by grace through faith in Jesus, in his atoning work on the cross. Upon believing, we are forgiven our sins. We are given the Holy Spirit, which gives us the power to live holy lives. This does not mean that we will never sin again. It doesn't mean that we're going to be sinlessly perfect, but it does mean that we are expected, that is, it is not optional to use that new power to overcome those sins that mastered us before and to confess the new sins that show up in our life. You know, it talks about in the, in the Lord's Prayer, we're asked to be forgiven of our sins. Uh, our feet need to be washed, so the rest of us are clean. John says, if we sin, we have an advocate of the Father. We, if we confess our sins, he's faithful to forgive us, etc. Striving to be holy with this new power, this new spirit that we have been given, is what Christianity is in a nutshell. I mean, look at the promises of the New Covenant and the Old Testament, uh, like Ezekiel 36, where it says, I will, you know, speaking of the new covenant, I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will keep my judgments and do them. What God wants is to purify for himself people who are zealous of good works. And when you have the spirit, it's not burdensome. To those who have never been saved, never really have known the power that the spirit gives you to want to do these things, we'll always see this 
as burdensome. We'll see it as works. We'll see it as religion because they don't know that it's real, that the power is real. But for those of you that have experienced it at some point in your life, you know that it was freedom and joy to resist those things that mastered you. And that the more that you sowed to the spirit, the less you even wanted to do it. To those of you out there that may be thinking, I don't think I've ever experienced that power, to you, I would say two things. The first is that it is available. It's real. I'm not lying to you. I'm not talking religious stuff to you. Uh, in my life, it happened the first time. And I don't, you know, in retrospect, I didn't even know this is what I was doing, but but having watched so many testimonies, I see it over and over again. It is people laying down their kingdom and saying, God, you are God. You are Lord. I want you to be the Lord of my life. What you are doing is important. What I am doing is not. I want to do what you want to do. And I know, and usually that encompasses some major sin that is mastering you at the moment, something that you usually have no intention of giving up because that's the nature of that kind of master. You will love the one and you will hate the other. If you have a secret sin that you do love, you know that when you're doing that sin, you don't love your other master. Um, so what I'm saying is it's not so much about laying down that sin. It's about repentance towards God an about face, you tor- you turn towards God and his ways and you turn away from your kingdom and your ways and you are open to whatever that means. And it means, the first thing is, a complete renunciation of that master. Jesus, a lot of people came to Jesus and they said, Lord, I'll follow you. What do I got to do? And what did he say in multiple instances? He pointed out what mastered that person and said, will you, will you give that up? And some of them went away sad because they would not give that thing up that, that mastered them. It's almost like all of us have this one thing. You know, if we assign over our head, we are this. It's our, our, our drug of choice. And the question is, what about that, that sign over your head? What are you going to do with that? And that is, if you will, kind of a representation of, if you will, lordship. That is, I believe, what Jesus is teaching when he says to people, Lord, I'll follow you. Well, you know, what about your, you know, the dead bury their own dead who puts his hand to the plow and looks back, isn't worthy of the kingdom, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So to finish up on this point about what I am saying and what I'm not saying, losing your salvation is possible. A truly regenerate Christian can lose that salvation and end up in hell. I will say that there appears to be so much grace in that falling. And at least in my case, I if I ended up in hell, I would say, wow, I had been warned so many times and in so many ways. The Lord is gracious to, to keep working with us. But we are, our lives are like grass. We are a vapor. The world does not revolve around us. You know, we don't have unlimited chances. I really, in some part of my dark heart, believed that I did get unlimited chances to, you know, get it all fixed. You know, of course I'm going to take care of all this stuff, but it's just, you know, I need some time. Well, everyone in the world believes that and they end up in hell still thinking, oh man, I thought I had time. Apparently the world doesn't revolve around me. All right, so what I want to do is I want to get into the biblical argument to a certain degree, and uh, we'll go from there. The first thing I did was started collecting passages on both sides of the issue. I started by just Googling, um, you know, best verses for once saved, always saved, and I would just collect them all. If I saw one that had not been mentioned in another article, I added that to my list, and I did the same for the other side, and I just ended up with these huge lists on both sides of the issue. I even then went through each one and continued to do cross-references with like uh, the treasury of scripture knowledge to get ones that maybe were missed by those people on the internet. So I started with this huge, you know, possible list on both sides. And then um, I spent a long time, uh, days, auditing those lists, just getting rid of passages that Um, were erroneous for whatever reason. I really only wanted verses that were speaking to the issue of if a person could or could not lose their salvation. I found especially on the once saved, always saved side, they offered up huge amounts of verses that were irrelevant. That is mostly verses that were speaking of justification by faith, 
which is a separate issue. Everybody on both sides of this issue believes that justification is by uh, faith. In the end, this is the count that I came up with. And I will say first that it really doesn't matter how many verses were on one side versus the other side. It's really about the quality, which we'll look at next. But here are the numbers. Uh, 51 verses for the idea that you could lose your salvation. So 20 of those I found to be explicit That is to say, they were explicitly saying that you could lose your salvation. 18 of those were strongly suggesting that you could lose your salvation. And nine of those I considered sort of honorable mentions. They were mostly this this idea that it's what I think of as conditional to finish, uh, endurance passages that when connected with the other explicit ones show that they're of the same theme and therefore should be added to this list. But in the passage itself, it's not it doesn't have all the elements that require it to be added to one of the others. And in addition, there were four parallel passages that I added to that number of 51. Of those 51, 16 specifically mentioned that sin was the reason that one would lose their salvation. Nine of those were be, uh, losing your salvation because of believing a different gospel. And eight of them were uh, as a result of persecution, tribulations, those kinds of things. So uh, people uh, scared for their life, given the opportunity to uh, renounce Christianity to save their life, etc. 18 of those did not have in the passage itself a reason that a person fell away, uh, though I would argue that if you broadened out the context, you could probably make a case one way or another for one of the other three. On the once saved, always saved side, the total number of passages I found to support it were 12, seven of which were explicit, three implied, and two honorable mentions. I really did try to be faithful with this. I really wanted to find the best arguments on both sides. I have since seen other Christians that did a similar study that came up with almost exactly the same count that I did, uh, 50 to 10, for example, instead of 51 to 12. I think one of the big takeaways here is that There are good passages on both sides, explicit passages on both sides, such that in a debate, I could say, well, I believe this because of this passage. And the other person would say, well, that can't be true because look at this passage. And that availability of good passages on both sides is why this issue has never been declared heresy in church history. That is, there have been lots of church councils and and stuff over the years about this. Um, And usually those councils will happily declare a doctrine heresy, but this one never went that far because the person was able to make a solid biblical argument. And in fact, in Protestant Christianity up until recently, I mean, think about this. The people that believe that you could lose your salvation, Methodists, Lutherans, Pentecostal, Church of Christ, some Baptists like Free Will Baptist. And then on the other side, you had pretty much just Baptists uh, and Presbyterians. And it really wasn't until recently, um, there's been kind of a Calvinist revolution in the last 20 years, I would say probably because of John Piper, uh, who I love, um, but certainly he has influenced things. And I think I love Calvinists. They are literally the best at justification. They're the best at preaching the gospel. They're the best at getting people into the kingdom because Calvinism grew out of a argument against the works-based salvation of the Catholic Church. It's why it existed. And so they really uh, are the best at arguing that point. In other words, I would say it like this. Calvinists are great with getting people into the kingdom but they really have no power in keeping them there. And I'll talk more about that and what I mean by that and their doctrine of the preservation of the saints, um, once saved, always saved, the tulip of Calvinism um, as we progress. But my main point here is to say, we've got these passages on both sides. Church history has basically been like, you know, either one is fine. Most of our Protestant denominations uh, have been on the side that you could lose it. Uh, although it has really shifted in the last 20 years to you can't lose it, I would say this may be a low blow, but I mean, you, it is really worldly, the idea. I mean, it's almost like a 
car salesman. It's like, I can get you into heaven with no, you know, you can do whatever you want, have two masters, the whole thing. I mean, it's what we would want. And so we have to be careful, extra careful that we're believing the right doctrine, knowing that this is definitely what our flesh would want, the low payments, no money down version of getting into heaven. So we have these two passages that seem to be saying different things about if you can or can't lose your salvation. If you're like me, you believe that there are no contradictions in scripture, so that there must be some kind of something you can plug into this equation that makes sense of both passages. So that if you're right, you can look at this passage and say, yep, that's what it means. And look at that passage and say, that's what that means. And you're not stuck having to argue this issue by just showing people the passages that you like and saying, well, look at this passage over here, pay no attention to these ones I don't like. Because I think that's what most of the debate that I see out there doing. And to the extent that they are forced to talk about the passages that they don't like, because if you're you know, preaching a sermon, you're not going to choose the passage you, you hate and you don't like to teach and go verse by verse on. But to the extent that they are forced to, typically in these questions and answers, you know, hey, Pastor John, why, what do we do with this passage that's really hard uh, based on everything that we teach? In those instances, you see eisegesis like nobody's business. You see people that are normally good teachers become bad teachers. It's it's mostly, I mean, we'll talk about the, the main things that they'll do, it, but mostly they look at all these 50 passages and say, well, I mean, it's talking about people that were never saved. These are false, uh, you know, sinner's prayer Christians or something like that, where that just doesn't work 50 times. It might work in some of these that are a little more vague. So the way I'm going to do this is I'm going to start by reading some of my top passages for conditional security, that you can lose your salvation. I'm not going to go line by line and explain these passages. It's my view that these more or less say what they mean and are pretty obvious. Um, but what I am going to do after this is go line by line through some of the once saved, always saved verses and we are going to do some pretty deep analysis of those. So here are some verses that I think speak to the idea that you can lose your salvation. 2 Peter 2, 20 through 22. For if, after they have escaped the defilements of the world through the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overcome, the last state has become worse for them than the first. For it would have been better for them to have never known the way of righteousness then after knowing it, to turn back from the holy commandment delivered to them. What true proverb says has happened to them. The dog returns to its own vomit, and the sow, after washing herself, returns to wallow in the mire. 1 Corinthians 9, 24-27 Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one receives the prize? So run that you may obtain it. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. So I do not run aimlessly. I do not box as one beating the air, but I discipline my body and keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. Do a word study on that word, disqualified, for extra credit. Hebrews 6, 4-6, through 6, For it is impossible in the case of those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift and have shared in the Holy Spirit and have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the age to come and then have fallen away to restore them again to repentance since after they are crucifying once again the Son of God to their own harm and holding him up to contempt. Romans 11.22 Note then the kindness and severity of God. Severity toward those who have fallen but God's kindness to you, provided you continue in his kindness. Otherwise, you too will be cut off. Hebrews 10, 26 through 29. For if we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a fearful expectation of judgment and a fury of fire that will consume the adversaries. Anyone who has set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on the evidence of two or three witnesses. How much worse punishment do you think will be deserved by the one who has trampled underfoot the Son of God and has profaned the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified and has outraged the Spirit of grace? 2 Peter 1, 10 through 11 Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election. For if you practice these qualities, you will never fall. For in this way, there will be richly provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Mark four sixteen through 19 And these are the ones sown on rocky ground. 
the ones who, when they hear the word, immediately receive it with joy. And they have no root in themselves, but endure for a while. Then, when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately they fall away. And others are the ones sown among thorns. They are those who hear the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches and the desires for other things enter in and choke the word, and it proves unfruitful. Hebrews 3, 12 through 15. Take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart, leading you to fall away from the living God. But exhort one another every day, as long as it is called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we have come to share in Christ, if indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end. As it is said, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. Hebrews 12, 14 through 17, strive for peace with everyone and for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble, and by it many become defiled, that no one is sexually immoral or unholy like Esau, who sold his birthright for a single meal. For you know that afterward, when he desired to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no chance to repent, though he sought it with tears. Colossians 1, 21 through 23, And you who were once alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him, if indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, became a minister. Matthew seven twenty one through 23 Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Galatians 6, 7 through 9, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that he will also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. And let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. Galatians 5, 4, You are severed from Christ, you who would be justified by the law. You have fallen away from grace. James 5, 19 through 20, My brothers, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wanderings will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. Some other passages that are not on my official list of 51, but I will read a couple of them now uh, because they do help to sort of frame all this, is these sins of the flesh passages that say, you know, these list of sins and implore Christians that this isn't even kind of what is about Christianity and tell Christians that those who do such things will not enter the kingdom of God. So let me read a few of these. Uh, Galatians 5, 16 through 21, for the desires of the flesh are against the spirit and the desires of the spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you, as I've warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. 1 Corinthians 6, 9-11 Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. 
there are lots of these passages and there's all this language telling them in plain English not to do this stuff anymore. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, but now you must put them all away. Uh, you, these things must not even be named among you. Um, th- who does these things has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ our God. Because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not become partakers with them. So let us cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the daytime. Okay, so I am done reading some passages that support my position. I am now going to move on to discussing some passages that would be offered up from the once saved, always saved side. Okay, so the first verse I want to talk about is Ephesians 1, 13 and 14. This is the passage that I, as a once saved, always saved believer, really hung my hat on. It was the one I would turn to to prove to someone else that they could not lose their salvation. It's also the passage that I found in talking to people over the last few months is the one that they bring up. And it says this, this is from the ESV. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Having believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. So the reason that this is such a strong passage for the once saved, always saved side is because of this phrase, the Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance. The inheritance in this case is glorification. So we get the Holy Spirit upon believing the gospel, chain of custody, and that Holy Spirit, according to this passage in the ESV, is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance. So if that's what the underlying Greek is saying, it's really hard to argue against this. Um, And I would argue that not only is that definitely not the right translation uh, for how to to present this, at the very least, it's incredibly reckless to translate the word Araban as guarantee, but especially given the implications of this, but it also changes the meaning of this passage. So I would say that Ephesians 1 is talking about spiritual blessings, and Paul goes through like three or four of them, ending with uh, glorification as the pinnacle of spiritual blessings. First, a disclaimer. I'm not a Greek scholar. I don't know Greek, but I can read lexicons, and I can certainly uh, look at the way that a word was used in other places in Scripture to see if it was used that way any other time. This Greek word arabon in the New Testament was first translated as the English word guarantee by the NIV in the 70s, followed just a few years later by the New King James Version. And then we have the ESV is probably the most famous modern version that has translated the Greek word arabon to guarantee. Uh, Most other, the vast majority of Bible versions translate the word as something like down payment, like the net or the HCSB, first installment, like the NASB, uh, pledge, the NRSV, uh, earnest, the King James and ASV. Strong's defines it this way. Oroban is of Hebrew origin and it means a pledge, i.e. part of the purchase money or property given in advance as security for the rest. So it's a financial term. It's used three times in the New Testament, but um, each one of those are almost exactly the way it's used in our verse. So it really doesn't help to define it in context because whatever it means there, it also means in Ephesians 1. Um, We can look at the uh, LXX, the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Old Testament, which would have been available in Jesus's day to see how they translated the Greek word in the Old Testament. And it's most often translated as surety. It's always a financial term. One time it's translated as mortgage, which I like because it's in a Nehemiah 5.3 where the people mortgaged their house. It's always what we would think of as a down payment. Uh, it is never used in the way that an English speaker would use the word guarantee. Let's say the word surety, okay? So that's a down payment. You definitely, a financial person, when they accept a first installment or a down payment or a mortgage payment, they don't consider it a guarantee that the person will pay that mortgage. You know, a financial transaction always includes the idea of default. In no way would any would any of these words be understood as a guarantee. In, in a passage like this, which would directly change the meaning and be so 
important as to being like a centerpiece for whether or not one could, I mean, one would base their entire worldview and salvation on this word. And I do think it really is that bad. I've heard uh, pastors preach on eternal security and they're leaning into this guarantee. I mean, it is the centerpiece of their sermons. What does guarantee mean? Is guarantee a guarantee? So what we need to figure out is in what way is the Holy Spirit, which we received at salvation, in what way is that a deposit or a first installment, which is to be redeemed at the resurrection? In what way is the Holy Spirit a deposit to be redeemed at the resurrection? The first place I want to turn to is Romans 8, 1 through 11. It's a lengthy passage, but I want to read the whole thing because I think it establishes uh, what Paul is thinking about when he makes these allusions to the Spirit being a seal and how it relates to resurrection and the future. He says, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, for the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. By sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the spirit set their minds on the things of the spirit. For to, for to set the mind on the flesh is death. But to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if, in fact, the spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. So in what way is the Holy Spirit a first installment or down payment to be redeemed at the resurrection of the dead? And I think this passage in Romans shows us at least two ways. The first is that Paul seems to suggest that the Holy Spirit is the agent of all resurrection of the dead. If you have the Holy Spirit, at the time of the resurrection, you will be resurrected from the dead. He says in the last part of this verse, if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead, so the spirit is what raised Jesus from the dead. That's not the first time this says that in the New Testament, that the Holy Spirit was involved in the resurrection of Jesus. If it dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his Spirit who dwells in you. So Paul is saying that the Holy Spirit who dwells in you is what's going to give you life at that day in the same way it gave Uh, life to Jesus when he resurrected from the dead. That's, I think, probably the most practical way that Paul considers the Holy Spirit a deposit to be redeemed at eternal life. It is the agent of resurrection. And it's not just our resurrection or Jesus's resurrection. It's mentioned, for example, in the two witnesses, Revelation 11, the Holy Spirit of God is what uh, uh, animates them in that three and a half days. Uh, But I think that there is another reason um, that's probably more appropriate to our discussion here in which the Holy Spirit is considered a deposit to be redeemed at the resurrection. And that is that God has given us the gift of the Holy Spirit in order for us to love to follow his commandments. That was the whole point of the new covenant. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will keep my judgments and do them. I will put my law into their minds and write it on their hearts. This was what the new covenant was about. Paul says in this Romans passage that it was impossible for us to do that without the Holy Spirit. For God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do. Um, For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. 
And it is because it is now possible for us to want to walk in righteousness. And we now have the power to resist those sins that were impossible for us to resist before if we walk in the Spirit, that that leads to the righteousness which leads to eternal life. Let me read a few passages to this end. Uh, 2 Thessalonians 2, 13 through 15, but we ought always to give thanks to God for you, brothers beloved by the Lord, because God chose you as the first fruits to be saved through sanctification by the spirit and belief in the truth. To this, he called you through the gospel so that you may obtain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. So then brothers, stand firm, hold to the traditions that you were taught by us, either by spoken word or by our letter. Galatians 7, 7 through 10, do not be deceived. God is not mocked for whatever one sows that will he also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from his flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the spirit will from the spirit reap eternal life. And let us not grow weary of doing good for in due season we will reap, that is we will get eternal life if we do not give up. Let's move on to a few other passages that are used to support once saved, always saved. And most, but not all, of these passages fall into a category I think of as elect passages. That is, passages that are referring to this group known as the elect. And if you asked a Calvinist what this debate about once saved, always saved was about, if you asked them to frame the debate, they would like to frame it this way. Can the elect lose their salvation? They like to refer to the debate that way because that's a debate they cannot lose. They can show lots of verses that show that the elect can't lose their salvation. But even they would agree that no one down here on earth knows who the elect are. Only God knows who they are. That's how they're referred to in the uh, in the Bible. The elect are those that God foreknows to endure, to not have their names blotted out of the book of life. It is a contradiction in terms to say that the elect can lose their salvation. In the Olivet Discourse, it says it's impossible for the elect to be deceived by the Antichrist and false prophet, but it also says that the Antichrist and false prophet's deception was made for the elect. So it's 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 designed for those who are the elect, but the elect ones are not able to be deceived by it. So if you're ever in a debate about this, you must be very careful to define the debate to say, no, it's not whether or not the elect can lose their salvation. Pretty much everyone agrees that they cannot. The question is, can a person who, a truly regenerate Christian, lose their salvation? Um, I should say at this point, it's very important to recognize this isn't against assurance of salvation. In fact, I think that is part of what the deposit of the Holy Spirit is. It's to be assurance of salvation, but not in the sense that the Calvinist would say. It's assurance, knowing that we have the Spirit, seeing the fruits of the Spirit in our lives, is assurance that we are currently in the faith. But it is not assurance that we will end our race in the faith. We can't know that. We can't know that we will do that. But we can know we are currently in the faith, and we are asked to know that. We are asked to look for the fruits of the Spirit in our our lives and in the lives of those brothers and sisters around us. That is part of the job. But anyway, back to these passages, and I think we'll start with John 6, 37 through 40. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whomever comes to me I will never drive away. For I have come down from heaven not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I shall lose none of all that he has given me, but raise them up at the last day." For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life, and I will raise him up in the last day. This is very similar to John 10, 26-30, which says, You do not believe because you are not my sheep. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. No one can snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my Father's hand, and I and the Father are one. I also think this is kind of parallel to that passage where Paul is saying what can separate us from the love of God, and he names this huge list of things, but notably missing from all these passages, the two John passages and that list of what can separate us from the love of God, is ourselves, is anything to do with sin. So I would say first, this is about the elect, of which of course I agree with every single word of this uh, in relationship to the elect, 
but it's also not speaking of falling away. I don't think that's what this verse is about, nor is it trying to say that. Although I will say that there is one aspect of this that really needs to be explained, and that is this. For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life, and I will raise him up in the last day. So this could be said, well, this is just a simplified version of this. It's not going through all the detail, but I think it's more important to figure out what this is saying here. Because everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life. Taking that at face value, if you believe in the Son, you have eternal life. The real question is, what does belief mean here? John 3, 36, the same book, a little bit before this, it defines belief this way. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Okay, so it starts off saying we're in the same context. We're talking about this. It's using the same phrase. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. But look what comes next. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. So in the same book, it seems to be directly equating belief with obedience, which is not at all out of context. I mean, it says, my sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. So before you can be a sheep that uh, can't be snatched out of his hands and all this other stuff, you need to do what? You need to follow him. Following him is linked with obedience here. And it's certainly linked with obedience. If you look at the New Testament, do a study of following Jesus in the gospels. And you'll find that lots of people asked and Jesus gave him gave them answers like, uh, let the dead bury their dead, you come follow me, uh, count the cost, um, son of man has no place to lay his head, he who puts his hand to the plow and looks back isn't worthy of the kingdom of God, so on and so forth. He wants you to give up your idols and to follow him. So if you want to be a sheep that hears his voice and have these promises apply to you, are you obedient? I think that's what a lot of these passages sort of boil down to. Um, but for now, I do want to move on to my notes about the things that I've been thinking about the implications of all this, especially as it relates to what I had been taught in the church. Once saved, always saved pastors have a lot of pretty words, but if you read between the lines, this is what they're all saying. And I'm pretty sure everyone would agree with me on this. They're saying that if you really have been given the Holy Spirit. That is to say, you didn't do a false confession or, you know, you weren't really saved in the first place. But if you really have been saved, like given the Holy Spirit, unlimited sin, you can do unlimited sin, as many sins as you want, any kind of sin you want, die in your sins, and you will still go to heaven. You can have two masters, three masters, a hundred masters, if you really have been saved. So then you would ask, well, what is the downside then? I mean, why shouldn't I go sin a little bit here, a little bit there, maybe even do a whole lot of sin? I mean, what would be the downside? I mean, we're human. We want to know how much we can do, how far we can go. And the answer is that the reason we shouldn't do that is that we would lose rewards in heaven, bonus points in heaven. We're all going to heaven anyway, but your heaven will be slightly less awesome than the next guy. And you will feel bad here on earth. That is to say, the conviction of the Holy Spirit will make you have a, you know, a bad day. And that it'll, of course, be bad for your health and stuff. It might ruin your marriage or other, you know, secular reasons not to sin. So I would say first about the feeling bad part. I've heard a pastor say, and I'm sure you have too, because I think I've heard multiple pastors say this. No one is the most pitiable person than a, sin, uh, a Christian who is in sin, who is a backslidden Christian. What they mean by that is the conviction of the, because that you're saved anyway, but the downside is that you just feel bad because a Christian who sins feels the worst. And I would say, I'm not trying to diminish the conviction of the Holy Spirit, because that's certainly there too, to the extent that they are saved. But they're also feeling shame. And you know who else feels shame? Literally everyone that sins. And so, do you know why the suicide rate is so high among those uh, unsaved, sexually immoral people? It's because 
shame, you know, people feel bad about their sins. So I would say, yeah, I'd say maybe some of those people are actually more pitiable and feel worse about their sin if they're killing themselves about it than a Christian who is sinning. It's just a thing that once saved, always saved pastors say, because they have no real tools to tell you why you shouldn't sin. So they've come up with these things that are lies. They say another thing, which is that you will lose rewards in heaven. Now, this is based on 1 Corinthians 3, 14 through 15, which says, if the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. So this is talking about probably the Bema Seat judgment in which you know, we do works for the Lord and we, you know, might go on mission trips and we might uh, write books and we might do other other things. And maybe they were in our flesh and maybe they were just sort of receiving a reward for ourselves. And really maybe the book that we wrote wasn't even on the right doctrine. We just thought it was a good idea. And maybe those, those works, some will be wood, hay, and stubble, and some will be, um, you know, good works that you'll get rewards for. But these passages have nothing whatsoever to do with your sin. Now, there are two types of once saved, always saved believers. David Pawson in his book calls them Alpha and Omega, once saved, always saved. The Alpha is sort of the hyper grace people. You know, you say the prayer. If you believe, that's it. You can literally do anything. It doesn't matter if you die in your sins, you, you're still saved, etc. And then the more Calvinist version, the preservation of the saints, uh, Pawson calls them the Omega version, meaning this, that... If a person is truly saved, they will not go back to their sin and they will not die in their sin. And if they do, then it proves that they were never saved in the first place. I think of that as an unfalsifiable trump card that they get to use to go to sleep at night. Because a pastor who has been doing this for a long time knows really well and is probably pretty confused about all the times he's seen a person get saved. He was there when they were saved. He saw the, the fruit of the Spirit in that person's life. He would have bet the farm on that person having the Holy Spirit. And yet, he saw him fall away. He saw him die in his sins. And now he's stuck with this conundrum, which is, well, I guess he was never saved in the first place. That is the Calvinist preservation of the saints' idea. And that's why Calvinists are so against the sinner's prayer concept, because to them, they have to put all the blame of all the world on false con conversions. So Calvinists are really outspoken against the sinner's prayer, because to them, since they don't believe that you can lose your salvation, all of the world's problems are because people made false professions. And I call it unfalsifiable because it only works for the person, the, the, that pastor looking into his congregants' lives. But it doesn't work, and the reason it's so dangerous, and the reason it destroyed, almost destroyed my life, is because it doesn't work for the person who knows that they were saved. For that person, because if you understand what they're saying correctly, look, I know that you can't know that I'm saved. I know it. You, you, you think that you know, but you can't really know. I can't know if you're saved. I can't know if anybody's saved. I can make a guess, but I can't really know. I get that. But I can know if I was saved, and I definitely was, you know? I mean, I went from darkness to light. I had, was just on fire. I felt the power, it tasted the spirit and, the, and the, the power of the ages to come. I was on fire. You know what I mean? I know, and some of you out there know. So for you, you don't have the luxury of thinking that you haven't been saved. So therefore, you must essentially default to the alpha version. So now we're back to, well, okay, what are the rules? I know I've been saved. I know I have. So that, I know the pastor can't know that, but I do know it. And the result of his teaching is, in that case, for a person who truly has been saved, i.e. me, there is no limit. One master, two master, a hundred masters, there truly is no limit. And the only downside is loss of bonus points and feeling bad, both of which have never stopped a single person who loves their sin from sinning. But think about it like this. If they were wrong, and if the doctrine, if you believe that you really could lose your salvation, so imagine a world in which you believed that 
you had a choice. You could choose the sin that you love that masters you, except you would go to hell. Or you could choose the way of righteousness and walking in the Spirit and Jesus in heaven. If those were your choices, one, your sin that you love, but you would have to leave Christianity in order to do it and go to hell, or give up the sin that you love and follow Jesus and go to heaven. In that case, if that's true, then sin is apostasy. It is leaving the faith. The only reason it isn't is because you have been taught that you can have two masters. When historical Christianity, including historical modern Protestant Christianity in America, the vast majority of them believed that if you were doing that, if you were going from uh, uh, being saved to going back to your sin, that was apostasy and you were choosing hell over the way of righteousness. That was normal Christianity until recently. And, you know, I would say normal Christianity, but the vast majority of non-Calvinists believed that. And so it's only recently that that we don't even define the word apostasy right anymore. It's interesting. I hear people talk about apostasy, and, and remember, they don't believe that apostasy is even possible. You, there is no sense in which a person that was saved can cease to be saved. So apostasy can't mean apostasy. So they define it as things like those uh, churches that have uh, women gay pastors, they're apostate churches, or apo- the, the Catholic church is an apostate church. And what they mean is churches that pretend to be Christians, but were never really Christians. So they've come up with a new definition of apostasy. In other words, we don't need to define it right anymore because we don't even believe it's possible we wouldn't know apostasy if it hit us between the eyes. Before I move on to my testimony, I want to briefly talk about something else in my notes, which is a lot of people will say, you know, hell, you're scaring people with hell. We don't want to do that and everything. And I, I would say, you know, why not? I mean, to me, that is a lifeline. Hell is like the best thing because as a person who does love my sin or loved my sin, the idea that there, I could burn the ships and say, look, I can't go back that way. That way, it's a non-starter for me to go back to that. It's in that moment that you get freedom from the desires which held you captive in the first place. It's an ironic twist of fate that the, the moment that you decide that there is no going back to that sin is also the moment that you get power over that sin that you never had before. So everybody's praying to you know pray the thing away, but they don't actually want to put it in their head like, no matter what happens, I'm not doing that again. It's in that moment that you get the freedom from the desires. So to me, hell is the thing that uh, I need and to make the kind of decision, the huge decisions to turn away from sin. All right. So let me tell you my testimony. I grew up in a nominally Christian household. We went to church occasionally. I do remember loving God as a child. Um, It didn't really change much in terms of my behavior or life or whatever. And by the time I was 16 or so, I really started getting into uh, alcohol and drugs, uh, mostly beer and um, and marijuana, uh, smoking cigarettes, that kind of thing. From about 16 to 26, I was pretty much from that moment, I was an alcoholic. I always knew that I was an alcoholic. I think I pretty much drank every day from in those 10 years. If I missed a day, it was because I just physically couldn't drink for whatever reason. I was sick or something like that. I always knew I was an alcoholic. It was something I didn't want to be, but I knew it had a power over me that was well beyond my ability to deal with. To the degree that I prayed, it was only that one day I could stop drinking. And I prayed for wisdom, I think, uh, those two things. Um, So yeah, I knew I wanted to quit, but I just didn't have any reason. It was interesting uh, in light of what I was saying before, that we need a good reason to quit. And I always knew that instinctively. I was in a band that traveled uh, extensively at the time, and I always was hoping that the band would say, look, Chris, you got to quit, and that would be my reason. You know, that's my, my version at the time of like what an ultimatum, ultimatum would look like, and that would be my reason to quit, a big enough reason, you know? Of course, the problem was that I never really, I never really got that crazy when I drank. I didn't black out. I didn't really act much differently than I did normally. Um, 
you know, so there wasn't really any reason for them to give me an ultimatum, except for I just, I drank a lot. And of course I made them all alcoholics by the end of it. Um, so that was that life. Eventually I met my wife who was my girlfriend at the time, was my girlfriend for many years before we got married. She was the one that ultimately gave me the ultimatum. She said, look, you know, we could never really get married if you're drinking. You know that. And I was like, okay, there it is. You know, that's my reason to quit something big, something worth it. And I quit drinking. I quit smoking cigarettes in the same day. Just decided to just cold turkey do it. It was really difficult for three days, but I had the best reason. My wife or my girlfriend at the time, the very best reason ever. It was the smoothest sailing, quitting, you know, after that, I quit for uh, at least five years, probably more. Um, during that time, we, oh, I should say, well, I got saved uh, after that. Not, not because I quit drinking. I think the quitting drinking and smoking uh, cleared the, my mind a lot. And that was a necessary precursor, I think, to me uh, getting saved. Uh, I talked Christian talk a little bit before then, but I certainly wasn't saved. Looking back on it for this testimony, I realized that I I was still smoking pot after I quit drinking. It was sort of my transitional uh, thing, right? So I never, pot was never, it was a far second tier for me for alcohol, but it was still in that family. I mean, it, there's no doubt whatsoever that that's, that pot is the same of the same family as alcohol. Never lie to yourself that it's different. It is the table of Satan. That's absolutely the truth. And, but so I was smoking pot and I was clinging to pot a lot because it was my, the thing, my, you know, the thing that I was doing, I transferred a lot of, uh, that to pot, but I was starting to be more convicted to being saved. And I remember the day that I think I got saved. Uh, it's hard to pin it point to exactly the day, but I think I do remember the day I was, had smoked pot. I'd been worked on, I'd been podcasting a lot and the podcasting stuff had really made me think more Christian thoughts. And I was being worked on in a lot of different angles with that. And so I was walking home or something like that. And I was on the road and I was high. And I remember having an impression that there was like an angel or something there. And the angel wasn't saying anything or anything. And I didn't see it in any way with my eyes. It was just some a strong impression that the angel was trying to tell me that there's all this possibility out there. There's all this, there's all, there's two roads ahead of you. One, you has all this stuff. And one is you with the pot. You have to give up the pot and it has to be for good. And I remember thinking, okay, you know what? All right. And I was already so, and it was right at that time, I think that I also, and I don't remember, it was, must have been right at that same time, I was also starting to hear the gospel for the first time, uh, these sort of early Calvinist videos. You know, I said they're really good at uh, getting people into the faith, and there is no better than people like Paul Washer and that kind of thing. And it was those videos, those early sermon jams, that for the first time I understood the gospel. Why Jesus died on the cross for my sins. It wasn't just a phrase you know, the great substitution and all this stuff, I realized, oh, that's it. And it was just coincided, right? I mean, probably not coincidentally at that exact same moment. And man, I was changed. I mean, I went from darkness to life. And for the next at least three, four years, I was just on fire. I remember at the time podcasting and talking about what I was going through and one of the, the terms that I mentioned was sin assassin. It was the way that I described this new fervor that I had to find new sins to stop. Like it was such a joy to, to like the freedom. And cause I've of course had tried to quit pot and stuff beforehand, but that day, you know, after I had been saved, it was just like, wow, this is a breeze. I, there's no, I, no going back to that. And I had made this sort of vow in a sense that I wouldn't go back to it. And I, I don't know if I, I think the Holy Spirit, whether or not you know about, I think to a lot of people out there have been abandoning their life of sin 
because the Holy Spirit prompts you to, and you don't, didn't make a vow as it were, and you didn't need the doctrine to do it. You're just, you naturally were listening to the Holy Spirit. I believe scripture is telling you the same story. So you, you just didn't, you just didn't go back to your sin, you know? But anyway, so sin assassin. That is how I described my desire for the example at the time to quit pornography. You know, it's like, you know what? That's one. I don't know why, but that's got to go. And so not only did I quit pornography, so I quit that, but not only did I quit that, but I quit, kind of did the Job thing of, of, of uh, not, you know, making a covenant with my eyes. I wouldn't look at a woman in, you know, the store or whatever. I would always, you know, you have to notice them at first, but then I wouldn't notice them there. And I felt like, wow, this is the ticket for this because it's like, if you don't dwell on that and start drinking in all the looking at women at that level, or the, these days, the scrolling level, you know, then you, that won't breed, you know, the outburst of sin later on with pornography. So if you're cutting it off at the, at the covenant with your eyes level, then you don't have to worry about the pornography level. But if you're trying to quit pornography, but you're still doing all the looking at people, you know, so I was learning all these things and I, and you know, I got it down to where I was just, you know, I was dealing with the kind of things that, you know, are unbidden, you know, anger coming up with this thing, you know, I don't want that anger, you know, deal with that. And you deal with all these other envy and pride and other things that are less, you know, very far down in the sin tier. And so in this time I got married and I should say that during this time was very fruitful. You know, I may, I was making videos, evangelism videos and, and, you know, became very fruitful with regard to, uh, uh, evangelizing and discipling people. And this is where it started to go a little bit wrong. On our honeymoon, um, remember, remember, the only reason I quit drinking, I, I quit drinking not for the Lord, as it were. I quit drinking for my wife. You know, many, you know, had been years before we got married. I quit drinking. And on our honeymoon, she kind of just sort of gave me permission to drink. You know, it'd been, it's been five, six years since you have drank. You know, I'm sure you can handle it, you know. And I, of course, could. That's the thing about it, is I could. And it was never like I drank before, not even close. In fact, I really couldn't even drink like I did before. I, I, like, I couldn't even drink a six-pack of beer um, without it being too much. I, but I found a way around it, which was I would get wine and water it down like 10 to 1. That's later on. Uh, but, and, and, you know... It never really got out of hand. It took a long time, many years for it to sort of progress little by little, you know, and I was truly saved when I started to drink again. And I sort of, you know, it wasn't the interesting thing about it is that I was already free from it. Totally free. I didn't, I didn't think about drinking at all, but once presented with the opportunity again, and then checking my theology at this point in my life, I thought I knew everything about theology, right? I'd been teaching it and podcasting about it and doing conferences and whatever. So I had an opinion about once saved, always saved. And of course, I believe that, yeah, a Christian can drink wine and there's really no problem with that. And, you know, after all, I have been saved. So there really isn't a downside. You know, even if I did get drunk, you know, or whatever, it wouldn't be that bad. I have been saved. I mean, I could lose a few bonus points for this. And then I start this progression. And that's the thing is once you start one of those sins that formerly mastered you or has the potential to master you, it's just a matter of time before you do it again. It's just a matter of time because now that door has been opened and it will not be shut again. You can do what I did for the next 13 years, which was um, quit a hundred times and start back up a hundred times. I would quit a year sometimes. I quit there was at least two years where I didn't drink at all I'd spread apart. Like one year here, one year there, there were months at a time. There were weeks at a time, but I always went back. And when I went back, I drank every day uh, again, smaller amounts. I, I was living in this operating under my own sort of rules kind of thing. I still knew that it was mastering me. I still knew I got to quit this. And I, but again, I did not have the theology that I had a really good reason to anymore. Um, you know, it wasn't hurting our marriage, or career, or anything like that. I mean, there was really no uh, worldly downside that I could see. I mean, health was always a concern. You know, if you drink, uh, you're going to die early and all that stuff and have a bad liver and all these other things. But uh, theologically, I had no problem with it. And, you know, like I said, the marriage uh, was just fine. Career was just fine. Eventually, I started dabbling in pornography again. This is also something that I had quit for years and years. I really did judge myself, uh, 
you know, on a different level, I would look at others and say, well, they do it. Even Christian men do this more than me, a lot more. And Christian men look at women and, and all this other stuff. So I'm better than them in that regard, you know, judging yourself by what you don't even struggle with all that much. So I really didn't even see the the sin of pornography until uh, I'm on the other side of this uh, testimony. So for the next many years, I would become an expert at quitting alcohol and starting up again. I was an expert at quitting. I was an expert at starting. I became also very analytical of my attitude when I would have these you know, okay, pour it all down the drain. This is it for me. Never again moments, which was all the time. And I was always super genuine. By my definition of repentance, I was truly repentant each time. I knew from my previous experience with quitting stuff that the secret to winning out of the temptation problem that would no doubt arrive two weeks from then or two days from then was that I had to have such good resolve, like to the degree that you could have resolve to never do it again. There were no special occasions. There were no weddings in the future. There were no instances that would happen that would cause me to drink no matter what. I was resolved to not do it. To the degree that I could have that kind of resolve was the degree that I could be free from the desires. I knew that there was a principle there. Um, And so I would try to muster that up. And that's what I think I was calling repentance. I would truly be sorry and ready to never do it again as I poured it all down the drain and that would last for five days. And then I would do it again. And so I became burnt out on my interpretation of repentance. Towards the end, the last couple years or so, I, it really started to get worse. Uh, not so much in like what I, the amount I was drinking or anything outward like that, but inwardly, it was becoming more of a master. And what I mean by that, it like a master tells you where to go and what to do and how much to do and especially what not to do. And, and that uh, was what alcohol was becoming for me. Also, some of these legal high stuff started to creep in towards the end too. And it was just getting worse. And I felt like it was also getting really spiritual. Like, I mean, I wouldn't have been surprised if there's actual like I don't know, demons involved with sort of the desire to drink. It started just getting worse, just getting worse. Like I was being more and more let over to that. And, um, you know, uh, I also started getting a lot of warnings, warnings, warnings everywhere. Uh, some of which were just impressions. You know, the Lord has always spoken to me in sort of this still small voice, never hear anything or whatever, but I kept getting like impressions of you don't get to do this forever. This isn't, you know, this, this is going to have an end point starting to be things like last chances are coming up here. You don't have many more chances like this. This has got to, you know, these impressions, uh, dreams, other people were getting dreams. They were like, Oh yeah, it sounds a lot like what I've been getting, you know, that this is not, can't go on forever, that there are uh, eternal consequences that, uh, and then, you know, it started to be even more apparent that these warnings were about eternal damnation. And I, you know, didn't believe it. I don't believe, I believe in one saved, always saved. So I took it with a grain of salt, but I knew, I knew something was up because as I say, I could start to feel this getting worse in my heart is the the control that it had over me or the control that it wanted over me. You know, it wanted to consume me. And if I let it, or probably more accurately, if God let it, it probably would. I think of like Judas when he, when, you know, he finally commits to it and Satan entered him. I mean, I don't know if something like that was going to happen. I don't know what, all I know is that I had no excuse at this point. There were just the equivalent of blinking red lights everywhere telling me that this was the last chance. I didn't even know what it meant, but 
because I didn't believe that and you know that I could lose my salvation but at the same time I kind of had to because the warnings were saying essentially exactly that so I was sort of like two of two minds I must be able to lose my salvation but I at the same time I, I can't but in, in any case it really came down to this final night where I you know extreme conviction dedication to qu- to quit and so I am uh, you know having these last drinks and I'm committing to never do it again going to pour it all down the the sink and everything and I almost have this one moment of wavering in my heart um, right at the end of the night. And there was just an extreme thunderclap at that exact moment. And I'm so thankful for that thunderclap because it was the thing that woke me up. I had the conviction. I knew that somehow or another I was being told that this was it. I don't get unlimited chances despite the things that I was telling myself. And this was the moment, now or never, you have to quit this and it has to be forever and there are eternal consequences. I don't understand it all right now, but that is it. And so I did. For the first time in 13 years, I had a reason. And that reason was vaguely about hell or something. And it was big and it was real. And the next day, I noticed something was different. Again, I had experienced lots and lots of quitting over the years and lots and lots of what it feels like to resist temptation. And this was different. It was like, wait a minute, I'm not even trying, really. I, I'm I'm like free. You know, usually I, the first two weeks was always the thing I would think about. You know, if I can get through that first two weeks, the rest of it, I have very worldly thinking about it. And it was just different. It was just like, oh, like something has changed here. Because, and I almost didn't want to jinx it. It's like, uh, is this some sort of anomaly or something? You know, uh, I, I want to hold on to this. I have something here. This is serious business. I, I don't even want to drink. So months and months and months pass. And I find that not only have I retained the desire to not drink, um, all of a sudden I got the sin assassin attitude again. And I am have quit pornography uh, you know, one of the things I did that was interesting about that, I'd always so, told myself that I hardly ever did it anyway, you know? And then I started putting on my app, uh, on my phone, my calendar app, like every time that I would, uh, uh, fail in that way, I'd make a little, uh, date and make it red or whatever. And I started looking at that and it was like, oh, I have been lying to myself. I'm doing this more than I was telling myself I was. And again, I wasn't even thinking of this yet in the eternal consequences situation, I just, what, what I looking back in retrospect, I had, I had the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit was convicting me of new sins that was making me want to quit pornography. And I took it a step further and I was like, you know what? I, 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 if I'm going to quit pornography, I, I have to completely never look at a girl again. I've got to, you know, you can look at a girl and notice that they're there, but then there's that second look, which is, you know, uh, you, the, the dwelling on it. And you think, well, it's impossible not to look. I'm telling you, it is possible. That's where I was. I was sin assassin. And it was really in that moment that I had really got rid of those things that were just absolutely grieving the Holy Spirit, you know, committing adultery in the sense, you know, Jesus says, which if you look at a woman with lust in your eyes, you've committed adultery with her. So I, here I was committing adultery regularly uh, and drinking drunkenness and all this stuff. And it was really in that piece there where I had finally had enough uh, 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 enough space to sort of think that I started to learn about this doctrine. The first thing that did it for me, and again, this is months after this, was I am watching these testimonies on YouTube of people that had died and gone to hell. And, you know, you've probably seen Bill Wace of 23 Minutes in Hell, and his story is so similar to others out there. I mean, hell is the same people describe it the same, but it is unbelievable how consistent these stories are. Please get yourself in a YouTube rabbit hole of watching people that have been to hell. It, if you need a reason, there's your reason, guys. If, 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 you know, if hell is just some abstract thing and you sort of like, ah, you know, hell is, you've already made it sort of a, a, in your own image, you know, it can't be that bad and blah, blah, blah. You've got your own reasons that hell wouldn't all be that bad. Watch these testimonies. You need to know, you need to know what these people have come back and seen. Even if just one of them is right, it is And they're all basically saying very similar versions of the same thing. I feel like I have a pretty good um, 
theory of mind, which is to say I can interpret correctly people's attitudes based on their facial expressions and, and voice. In other words, I can really pick out a liar and a, and a uh, actor very easily. And either these people are the best actors of all time or they believe what they're saying. So that was something I started to, to, to watch. And one of the things about that is that a very consistent thing in these things is people professing Christians in hell. I mean, these people are some of the most once saved, always saved are is wrong people I've ever heard. You know, Bill Weiss was an interesting thing. He was actually one of the people that I said earlier had done an independent study that found the exact same amount or pretty close to the same amount of verses on both sides of the issue. Bill Weiss of the 23 Minutes in Hell fame, he was the one that did that independent study saying, look, you know, because I think a part of his study is he, a story is that he saw these professing true Christians in hell. And I am the happiest I've ever been in this sin assassin driven, driven to walk in the spirit for the rest of my life, assurance of salvation, or at least assurance that I'm, I have the Holy Spirit filled with the joy and the desire to live righteously. And I want to say, you know, People say, Chris, you're saying we'll never sin again. Well, what about if you if you sinned, if I went back to drinking again, would I immediately go to hell or something like that? And I would say this. I don't think so. I think that there's so much grace in here, but it's so dangerous to mess around with one of those sins, those sins of the flesh, those habitual sins, because let's say I did. Let's say I went back to a sin that could master me, like drinking. I had a a drink at a bar or something like that. Like I said before, it's just a matter of time before I do that again. So this is now my definition of, of repentance, that after struggling with that so much and trying to figure out what does repentance even mean if it's not all these attempts at quitting. And repentance to me is literally quitting the thing for good. Like, If I end up never drinking again, then I will have repented from drinking alcohol. Then sure, I have an advocate with the Father, and I, you know, that's what we do. The the Lord's Prayer, you pray and your feet need washing, but we go on and yes, we he is faithful to forgive us of our sins. But to the true Christian, this is what I think. You, You know, it's why it's like those are saying, those verses are saying, like, these things shouldn't even be named among you. Because I think you get so far as you mature in Christianity that those things like idolatry and adultery and witchcraft and uh, uh, drunkenness and all these things are so far behind you. It was like me on that, you know, before I, I drank that, I'd been sober for five years. It was the last thing on my mind was was uh, drinking alcohol. I wasn't burdened by it. I was done with it. If I never had been like thought that it was okay... I would have never done it. It wasn't like I did it because I was just, oh, I got a drink. It was just like, oh, I guess I could drink, you know? And when I started that process, it it opened this door that took 13 years to resolve. And so that's why it's dangerous to go back into a sin that has ability, the ability to master you is because it will master you. If it give you, if you give it an inch, it will just be a matter of time before you do it again. So the, the progress of those kinds of sins is you do them until you stop doing them forever. Those are, that's the two options with those kinds of sins. You're either on the wagon or off the wagon with those. It's not worth the risk. But even though I think there's tons of grace involved there, I think that the Christian life for me going forward is now I look at these sins like anger and unforgiveness or or, or pride as just as bad, if not worse than the sins I was dealing with before. I've I've got plenty on my plate that I'm working on right now. There are sins that I wasn't even on my radar before when I had adultery and drunkenness to deal with. But now that I'm past those, you know, pride and and anger look pretty big to me. And they look like something I'm excited to work on with the Lord. And yeah, I get angry. And even if I forget to, you know, ask the Lord's forgiveness or something like that, I mean, there's grace covering all this stuff. I I don't even know what the answer is about that. 